Lawmakers is brought to you in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and through the financial support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Lawmakers. I'm Mark McDonald at the Illinois State Capitol. But between the Senate chambers on my right and the House chambers on my left, and this place will be buzzing pretty soon this afternoon with new activity in the spring session. But earlier this week, we went through the uh, election primaries, the state of Illinois, and, and actually we have one of the participants in the primaries with us for statewide office, Jill Tracy, representative from Quincy. Thanks so much for being with us. I wish I could say congratulations. I, I, our, our condolences on losing by that much. Thank you. Just it, a it little bit. It was an bit. experience of a lifetime, so I'm, I'm glad to do it. And Illinois is certainly worth every effort that I, I put forth. So I, I'm certainly committed to uh, the state of Illinois still. You, you and Kirk Dillard ran a very, it was, it was an unusual campaign in that with a week to go, it looked like Bruce Rauner was ahead by between 17 and 20 points. At the end of the election, you lost by 2.7 percentage points, I think. And that's a skinny, skinny bit, isn't it? It is, given that uh, Illinois is a huge state with almost 13 million uh, citizens, yeah. so yes it is. Yeah. Um, what, were your, what are your observations now, never having run for statewide office before, now that you've been through that experience? Well, I mean, it's, as I said, it was an experience of a lifetime, and I'm still committed to the state of Illinois. I think uh, overwhelmingly throughout the state of the 102 counties I visited, the, the mes message and the theme was the same. People want to see their state turned around. And uh, to see Illinois job projections being the lowest in the nation and our unemployment being either third or fourth highest in the nation, they want to see job opportunities. They want to see their state resume its presence in the, the Midwest as the capital of the Midwest. And, and most of all, they want job opportunities for their families mm -hmm. to have a good quality job. What, what do you think, what, the, what was the message that started to resonate toward the end of your campaign with Kirk Dillard? What, what did you feel like was working? Well, you know, it's hard to say. Downstate did carry us very well, and that's certainly my my uh, expertise. Well, if I, I wouldn't say expertise, but certainly where I work the most because I, I'm very familiar with downstate Illinois, central Illinois, and also. Um, I, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, people are frustrated with government. I, overwhelmingly, I heard that. They are so frustrated. And, and we saw very low voter turnout as a result, I believe. Mm -hmm. And we have to convince people that Illinois can turn around and that they can participate and their voices be heard. So uh, I think in the end, uh, people were concerned that uh, the change in, in leadership might not be good. And there were a lot of uh, group efforts brought. And, and Kirk and I saw a broad base come together as a coalition in Illinois, recognizing that, well, as a minority party in this state, that we're going to have to have a, a broad coalition of support. Mm -hmm. And uh, very much uh, the public employees and the teachers turned uh, to, out to support us uh, and, and recognize that they want their voices heard in Illinois mm -hmm. government. Now, you knew this going in when you when you put your name on the ballot for lieutenant governor, that you were going to have to not put your name on the ballot for state representative. So yes. there will be a new state representative yes, uh, for, for the Quincy, uh, di for your district. Right. Um, what are your plans and, and what do you, do you want to get back into state government or? Well, I, I made sure that I had a very good candidate uh, that I, I could support for uh, state representative, Randy Fries. He uh, had run before for the state Senate and uh, I wanted the, my West Central Illinois district to have a strong voice in Springfield and to have a, a conservative voice. Uh, that's uh, the consensus of, of most in my region. And so um, what lies next ahead, I'm going to continue to work to make the state better again. Mm -hmm. I'm committed to that, and I will do whatever I can. I, I lent my strengths and talents to help uh, Senator Dillard. Uh, it wasn't my choice to want to run for lieutenant governor uh, initially, but if I could have helped, uh, you know, I, I wanted to. So I'm I'm committed to that. I, I was born here, raised here. I, we raised our family here. Great quality of life. I had a good public education. I'm committed that people who want to stay in Illinois have that same opportunity. Did you enjoy your stint in politics enough to get back in? You know, I did. I did. Uh, you know, when you, you meet a, a constituent that has a problem and you can help, you want to turn that around. I was just working on an issue uh, for a, a Galena, a new craft distillery, and uh, worked right away to, to see if we couldn't help that individual. Mm -hmm. see, because it brought jobs and he had made a major investment in the state of Illinois. So when you have that opportunity to help people, and uh, work for the good of Illinois in that regard. Yes, I, you know, it's uh, so I, I want to do whatever I can. 
it's a special position. It really it is. is. State it rep, is. Our state senator, Senator Andy Menard from Bunker Hill. Thank you for being with us. We didn't mean to ignore you, but but Jill had a lot to say. Of she said a busy, she busy week. Of course she did. Actually, a busy she season. Has. Yeah. Um, your your observations on on the primaries that just we'll, we'll get into the uh, into the governor's race in, in, at all in a little bit. But any overall observations about uh, any weirdness about this state? Yeah, I think this was a strange. Primary, yeah, it, it was a, it was um, I think in many regards it was it was different than than most. Uh, turnout being low. Um, you know, I think um, the one thing I heard the most this week was, you know, the lack of yard signs, which is, you know, something that many people pay attention to as, a, as kind of a, a gauge of interest. And I think that had a lot to do with the weather more than anything uh, leading up to the primary. It's hard to get a yard sign in the ground when the yard's frozen. Um, but, but I think the turnout low, uh, being low, uh, was, was to me the most striking thing coming out of Tuesday. Yeah. Um, let's talk about state business for a little while. We get back to, to the primaries in a little bit. Um, your, your pet project, the Education Funding Committee, which, yep. which you headed up and which is now, I understand, going to be written up as a bill. Yeah. Where does this stand and, and, and what will that bill look like? Well, we, we started the process last year, um, right, after, um, right after I was sworn in uh, to the state senate after the last election. Um, we hope to have a bill filed uh, that, that encompasses the committee's uh, bipartisan recommendations uh, the week after the governor's budget address, which is next week. So within two weeks, um, I hope to have a bill filed that has uh, a coalition uh, behind it, both in terms of its sponsorship and in terms of the problems that it seeks to address. Uh, because uh, I've said this many times that, that we're still distributing money the same way we did in 1997. And the state has changed yeah. dramatically. The district I represent, the district Jill represents, has changed dramatically since then. So we have to get the law up to date. And that's a, it's a difficult task. Uh, but. But the good news is we've come a long way in just a year uh, to build support across the state to do this. We had a long way to go, too, yeah. so I want to put that out there. But, but the next step is a bill, and hopefully within a couple weeks we'll have that filed so educators from across the state can, can look at it, can read it, can critique it. That's an important part of this process. It should come under incredible criticism because this is uh, going to recommend uh, very large changes to how we distribute money. So that deserves criticism. And um, if it survives that criticism, then I think we'll be in a better place. And as you noted, when bills like this become law, they oftentimes last for decades. Yeah. And if this one is a good one, if people, if, if this becomes law, it, it could be around for a long time. So you want to get it right. Absolutely. And and you know that uh, I said this, um, I said this uh, a few days ago in Peoria. Uh, Senator Kaler invited me to meet with his uh, superintendents from. Uh, from Peoria and some uh, surrounding counties, and I said, I want you to criticize the bill when we file it. And um, one of the superintendents said to me on the way out, well, you shouldn't invite criticism on a piece of your legislation. <laughs> but uh, I, think, yeah. I think we should. And I think that's an important part of this process because uh, we know the path we're on is a broken path. Uh, there's not too many legislators from either party, from any part of the state, that say that we're doing it as good as we can do it today. Uh, so in order to get us to where we need to go, we have to be critical of whatever is proposed. And I think we can get to a better place, and that's going to involve now a legislative process, which is, of course, much different than issuing a report. Mm -hmm. uh, legislative process can be cumbersome. Um, it can be time-consuming. Uh, but for the first time in 17 years, we're starting that yeah. process, and I think that's a big yeah. accomplishment. You, you get ready for some amendments, don't you, Absolutely. In, in, in your own mind? Yeah. yeah. Um, Jill, he mentioned the governor's budget address, and uh, the, go the governor was careful to set that back after the primaries. What do you expect to hear from him? Well, uh, yeah, you know, you're never sure with Governor Quinn, <laughs> so I don't know. But, I mean, certainly it's a tight budget year. The House and the, the Senate took appropriate action, I believe, to uh, look at our revenue projection and say, and cautiously step back and say, okay, and, and the House, $34.5 billion is what we expect because we still want to have uh, an ability to pay down our old bills and uh, prioritize, prioritize funding. And that's going to be critical. So I know a lot of the appropriation committees have already started that work. And uh, I, I commend uh, Senator Menark because, as we know, education funding yeah. is a critical piece of that. We've got to fund public education. And we've certainly seen that it is an archaic system of funding. And I heard about that all through the state as well. And uh, certainly all of our school districts have used up their reserves. And down the state always suffers from transportation cuts. So I think uh, he's to be commended. And I, I think 
if we work backwards as to where our priorities have to be, public education, public safety, infrastructure improvements, and then, um, you know, sadly we'll see some very deep cuts mm -hmm. in, the, in the other areas, yeah. but uh, we've got to recognize that this state has got to address its fiscal woes. So, um, you know, as far as the, the governor's budget address, you know, certainly I think we'll hear, I mean, usually we hear, you know, kind of an optimistic, and certainly we've got to keep an optimistic outlook, but recognize that it is very difficult this year with funding. Yeah. Andy, what do you expect to come out of it? I, I, you probably look at it a little differently, being in the majority party. What do you what do you expect to hear the governor? Well, I think I think the, the the first answer I'd give you, Mark, is what I don't expect is a six month budget. You know, there was there was um, uh, for a couple weeks there was speculation that uh, the governor would propose a six month budget because of the uh, timing of the um, tax increase expiration, which is the end of this current year, uh, which also coincides halfway through the fiscal year. Um, I, I, I don't expect that at all. Matter of fact, I, I expect the governor to do exactly opposite of that. Uh, I expect the governor to pro provide a five-year budget framework, which I think is a, a good step in the right direction. Uh, what I hope to see is, is an effort to continue to pay down the backlog of bills, um, to continue to make sure that we uh, curb spending in places in the budget that have grown exponentially in recent years. There have been efforts to do that. I think there should be a continued effort to do that. Um, so I'm hopeful that when we convene next Wednesday in, in a joint session, we're going to hear a pragmatic and disciplined approach uh, to a five-year budget for the state. I think that ultimately is, is one major step we can take to, to turn the corner. I think we've done a lot of things well. I think we have a whole lot more to do. But I think looking at it from a, from a five-year snapshot is a very good first step. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Jill, however, the, 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 the Rauner Quinn campaign has already started. And yes. it's going to be in full speed throughout the next six months. Right. How do you think that's going to affect this entire budget picture? Well, I think it will. I mean, certainly the governor has come out very forthright with that he thinks the minimum wage ought to be increased. And I, that'll probably be contained in that budget address. And, you know, small businesses downstate just can't afford that. Yeah. And, and, that and the jobs that it will take with them if those small businesses close or cut back is going to be real hurtful for downstate Illinois. So um, it's uh, certainly, as you're right, those dynamics are going to be there, and uh, they will put, it be a major force in how this this year is going to yeah, go. Yeah. Uh, on the on the minimum wage raise, uh, Andy, can you can you see that as being is it viable? I mean, in, in your district, uh, you're, of course, downstate, and uh, a lot of the folks in your district are suffering economically. Is that something they can do? I, I support a modest increase, um, but, but I'd like to see it um, alongside that proposal, uh, which, which there's multiple proposals working you know, their way through, I know the Senate, I would presume in the House to some degree. Um, I'd like to see a broader discussion about tax reform in the state. Um, the, the small business argument is one that, that I, of course, am very sensitive to. Uh, I think there's other things we can do uh, with the tax code that would be beneficial to small businesses because they truly are job creators in, in districts that, that we represent. Uh, and we've ignored that uh, to a degree that I think it deserves uh, an incredible amount of discussion this session. Uh, I don't know if we're going to get there or not. Um, there's, there's a proposal also, uh, you know, a verbal proposal to have uh, the minimum wage increase on the ballot, you know, so there can be a statewide vote. Obviously, it would be advisory only. Um, I think there's multiple moving parts. Um, again, I think this boils down to decisions we make, uh, whether it starts next week with the budget or ends at our scheduled adjournment on May 31st. We need to be disciplined and pragmatic about it. And, and I think that's the best thing we can do moving forward as a state. Yeah. Jill, we've talked about Andy's education funding bill, or coming bill. Um, what what are bills are you watching or sponsoring or in favor of and would like to see become law? Well, you know, certainly you want to see um, anything that would promote economic growth right now. And uh, I had worked on something with uh, the Illinois Procurement Code. I don't know if it'll go forward or not. Be recognizing that it had some archaic uh, parts of it. Uh, certainly, as, as Andy mentioned, we, we have to look at uh, reforming and maybe just as his education uh, bill does, is uh, looking at how we go forward and maybe put together a new tax uh, or a, the way that we tax and the way we offer job credits and all that. We want to uh, promote economic growth in this Illinois and much of it has to do with our old uh, tax system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
we're, we are going to see, I, I just get your reflections quickly on this. This is going to be a very uncommon gubernatorial election. Um, the populist Pat Quinn, the incumbent, always runs as an outsider. And uh, we have a, 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 a Bruce Rauner, the, uh, the Republican, talk about running as an outsider. One year ago, his name recognition was zero. So you've got, you've got a very uncommon matchup here. How do you foresee this unrolling? I don't know, you know, it, just having gone through just the small months that I was in, but all in all, the state of Illinois and its citizens have got to be a winner at the end. And that means our state's got to move forward and get jobs. Mm -hmm. Andy? I, I think we'll find out soon enough. I don't <laughs> think it's going to take too, too long a time to, to get the answer to that question. I, I, I've, uh, I've hoped and I've, I've, uh, I'm going to run myself, you know, I'm up, and up this year that, that we should run on uh, facts and issues. Um, we ought not be afraid to put solutions on the table. Uh, we face any number of hurdles in this state and we have to start to solve those problems. Sometimes that means you've got to put your neck out on the line to do yeah. it. Uh, but that's the only way we're going to get these problems solved. And I would hope that those running for governor uh, will do that as well. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting. Senator Menard, Representative Tracy, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Welcome back to Lawmakers. I'm Mark McDonald and we have switched guests on you. C.D. Davidsmeyer from Jacksonville is here. Uh, representative and Senator John Davidson, or John Sullivan, sorry John Davidson, <laughs> Senator John Sullivan from Rushville. Thank you both for being here. Thanks, Mark. Good to be here. Uh, representative, uh, kind of a wild and rocky week. With, the, with It was the strangest primary election I think I've ever seen. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's been a, a whirlwind, like you said. I think, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of ups and downs, a few surprises, a few uh, that I think some people saw coming. Yeah. So. Uh, it, it was interesting to say yeah. the least. John Sullivan, we got a chance to talk to uh, another rep from Quincy, you know, Jill Tracy, oh, of yes. course, who was intimately involved right. in the election. Right. She was, of course, you know, deflated, but uh, they worked really hard. Yeah. And uh, it was a, it was a, a interesting outcome because when they went into that uh, two weeks in, they looked like they were 20 points behind, and they and they closed so fast, it looked yeah. like they might take it. Yeah, you know, it was a it was a historic election, really. I mean, from the standards of the participants and the money that was spent, and uh, really, you know, closing that gap. I mean, I think if there'd have been another day or two or three days, they might have been able yeah. to close it all the way. So, pretty, uh, you know, pretty interesting. And now, uh, now we know who the two nominees are. Yeah. We're gonna, we, we're gonna be. Uh, I think everybody's gonna be pretty busy over the course it's of the next be, several it's months. It's gonna be rough and tumble. Yeah, it yeah, really is because be. these two. We pointed out this in the program earlier. These are two very unlikely candidates to yeah. face one another. You know, they're both label themselves sort of as outsiders. Uh, one's a populist, one's a rich guy. You know, he's going to be labeled a rich guy, and, and it's going to be very interesting yeah. to see I how I think, they you know, it's going to be that, uh, it appears it's going to be the whole argument of uh, the uh, uh, the embedded, you know, uh, long-term uh, versus the outsider, right? Yeah. So I think that's going to be, uh, and, and, and let's face it, uh, Mr. Rauner is very wealthy, and uh, I think that there will be, yeah. you know, that, the wealth versus the, you know, the, uh, the working for the little guy type of uh, uh, an argument well, out there as well. Let me ask you, so. Senator, because it, this is an interesting question. You've been in public life for a long time. Yeah. Is it possible for an outsider like Bruce Rauner to actually shake up Springfield? Is it possible? Well, it's... Uh, you know, he's, he's come into, he's already started off this election. I, this is my 11th year, so I don't know, does that make me a long-term uh, career <laughs> politician? I'm not sure. This is actually about my third career. But, uh, you know, he, he's pretty much offended uh, a vast majority of the people here in Springfield in both parties, not just one, but both parties. So how, how is he then, if he's successful and becomes a governor, I think he's going to have a very difficult time uh, bringing people together and saying, okay, the way you move forward with ideas and legislation and, and get things accomplished is you need the support of enough people to make your ideas and, and uh, uh, proposals law. And if he is going to continue to bash and bash and bash individuals who uh, are working very hard and trying to represent their districts, I, I don't know how successful he will yeah. be. So I'm really worried that if that happens, how, how much of a gridlock we're going to be in here in Springfield. Well, CD, there is a difference between campaigning and governing. Correct. And he might find that what wins at campaigning doesn't win at governing. Yeah, and, and you know, I come from a business background, so um, what you, how you make a decision in business, you know, the boss makes a decision and, and everybody below follows. In this case, he's not dealing with employees. He's dealing with 
equals. He has to work with us to get something done, and I think I think he'll realize that. Um, I think government always works better when there's a little bit of a balance, and I think we may get a little bit more done um, uh, when we have that balance. Yeah. You know, you have an interesting idea coming coming from Jacksonville and having watched the Jacksonville Developmental Center close yeah. and watched that huge property there just sort of waste away. Correct. You've got some ideas about that. Yeah, we've been working with uh, the city of Jacksonville as, weather, uh, as well as a number of other communities throughout the, uh, the state that have old state property that's getting dilapidated that the state's paying for and uh, and nothing's really becoming of it and the the idea behind what we're trying to do is encourage growth and investment in the state property to get it off the state rolls so we don't have to continue to maintain it and get it back on the tax rolls so that we can uh, uh, earn a little income from it and it's a, it's a tax credit issue so you know, really whether your school district decides to, to purchase the property or take over the property, they could sell those tax credits or a, a private investor could come in, uh, create a business there and uh, they'll get the tax credits but it'll also be uh, providing mm -hmm. uh, long-term jobs and, and investment in the community. Are you working on a bill to that effect? Uh, we are, there's, there's a bill in the Senate that uh, um, off the top of my head, I don't remember who's, who the uh, uh, chosen sponsor was, but it's going to come over into the house, and uh, Larry Walsh is going to pick it up, and I've been working with Larry very closely on this. Good. This well, there are a lot of those facilities around. I mean, Jacksonville's not the only town that's, got, uh, that's got that problem. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably part of the reason why Larry Walsh is picking it yeah. up, right? Because Joliet. he's in the Joliet area, and I think there's was some uh, vacant facilities yeah. up there as well. So yeah. exactly. it's it's an issue across the state. You're keeping an eye on an interesting one too. You know, we've seen these wind developments all over the state, yeah. and uh, I guess little did we know when we started uh, giving permits for all this that there was no statewide regulation of this stuff, was there? Yeah. No, there isn't. So right now there are a number of wind developments. Uh, wind farms around the uh, around the state um, and each county right now is uh, regulating those themselves in other words they're creating their own ordinances and their own own laws and rules and regulations and they vary quite a bit from county to county some counties have done a I would say a very good job of trying to address all of the issues the road road issues and siting issues and decommissioning and so on and so forth uh, other counties maybe because they uh, did that process early on and they didn't know all what was going to be involved with it or they simply don't have the resources. You take a large county with a lot of staff and a lot of resources versus a smaller county that maybe doesn't have it. Uh, and so there's been, really been a, I, I, what I would say a hodgepodge of different rules and regs around the, uh, around the state. I've introduced a bill that would create a statewide standard of regulations uh, for the siting, uh, the uh, ag mitigation agreements and then the decommissioning of wind turbines mm -hmm. and so I've been working on that issue and uh, I've got mm -hmm. a lot of response from it. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a, you bring up an interesting point not, not only getting going but what happens when when these wind farms have to be dismantled yeah. Taken up. What, what, what happens? Whose responsibility is? What happens to all those deeds and all the all the? You know exactly. So that's the decommissioning yeah, side of it. Yeah. So that's the third leg of the chair, if you will, and uh, the stool. And so, right now, uh, we know at some point in time those turbines and those towers are going to need to come down. Well, yeah. there's you know 20 or 30 feet of concrete uh, at a minimum. It's you know it's it's. I don't know, anywhere from five to 10 feet deep. I'm not even sure, but there's yeah. a lot of concrete. It's sometimes gonna, at some point, it's gonna have to be removed. Obviously, the tower, the turbines, uh, you know, maybe the, uh, the power lines uh, running out to it. Uh, and so that needs to be addressed. And so we wanna make sure, and the reason I've introduced the legislation, working with Farm Bureau on this issue, is, is that when they, when they do come down, whether that's five, 10, or 50 or 100 years from now, when they do come down, that they're that it's done and that the resources are there to make sure they're done properly, safely, and uh, the land put back the way it was. Now that the primary is behind us, the governor's uh, budget address will occur next week. CD, what do you expect to hear? Um, I, I think that we're going to hear uh, a lot of gloom and doom. I think generally, uh, my feeling of what we hear is is uh, um, the issues that are important to the governor will be uh, fairly protected. I think the issues that are important to the general public will be kind of thrown out there as a, a 
you know, political scare, whether it be education, you know, elder care, things like that. Those tend to be those uh, political hot button issues. But uh, you know, I, th I think he'll continue to talk about early childhood education, um, and, and we'll see we'll see where we go. Yeah, N John, new programs are going to be are going to be hard sell this year. What do, what do you expect to hear? Well, we've we've talked about this before on this very program, and, and the governor is going to have to put a budget together using the re the revenues that are in current law. And so we're going to see, because of the current law and because of sunsetting of the temporary income tax halfway through this fiscal year, we're going to see the governor has you know, somewhere about two to three billion dollars less in revenue to put this budget together this year than he had last year. There is some natural revenue growth that may not be quite that much. So the point of the matter, and to CD's point, it, it is going to be a doom and gloom budget. I, I think there's no doubt about it because current law, without changing it, uh, is going to the, we're going to see some dramatic cuts to education um, and some of the other programs, yeah. that, including yeah. human service programs and so on. All the agency staffing is going to be is going to be pretty brutal. Once he's done that, I think the, the question is then where do we go from there? What's the discussion going to have? We have to pass the budget. It's got to pass the House and the Senate. We have to do that before the 31st of May. Um, I always say that the governor's budget, when he makes his budget address, it's an outline. It's it's really the it's a it's another step in this process. We're going to take a look at that, and we're going to hear from our constituents. Quite frankly, yes. We've, uh, I know CD and I have been at different meetings with school uh, uh, superintendents and school districts, and uh, uh, I've tried to prepare them for this budget uh, that they're going to be looking at here in a couple of, in about a week or so. So uh, once once people in the public see what this looks like, I think we're going to hear from them, and then we're going to be in a position where we're going to yeah. make some decisions. Well, you know, we've the, uh, already seen numerous first. cutbacks in small districts and large uh, already yeah. uh, from from the present budget. And I, I, you know, I, it's going to be interesting to see if they can cut back any further because so you're, we funded them at 89 percent the general state yeah. aid last year. Uh, you know, I've heard some numbers that it could go down in the 60 percent range. Well, if that happens, school districts will not Close. be able to survive. I mean, it's just that is not acceptable. Yeah. We can't do that. So, but I. The governor may well, very well have some of those yep. uh, uh, numbers in his budget. And the fact that this is going to be a rocky election year, do you think that's going uh, to have an impact on how the budget is actually built? Yeah, how could it not? I mean, honestly, how could it not? So we have, now we know who the, the, the two nominees are to run for governor for the state of Illinois. They, I certainly hope that they each take a position as to what direction the state needs to go, because obviously, one of them is going to be the governor, and we need to know where they stand on these issues. You know, what what are the priorities? How are we going to fund government? If there are cuts that need to be made, if somebody believes that we need to cut government, uh, great. Tell us what that is. How are you going to do it? And I think we need specific plans, and not you know not some of these general talking sound bites right, that, we get, uh, right. that we've really seen up to this point right. on both sides. Yeah, yeah. it will. It, it's the, the uh, politics will play more of a uh, role in this budget year than yeah. in any prize since you've been around. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I think it's an opportunity to have the discussion of, of uh, you know, what we're here for, what is government created for. Um, we can look at possibly, you know, some pet projects that still may be uh, run around in the budget. And this may be an opportunity to say, hey, you know, is this something that, that we really need right now? Mm -hmm. I said early on, it's going to be a historic election in a historic year uh, because of all the issues that we're dealing with because of the two individuals that are running for governor, because of the, uh, the situation with the revenue and the budget here at the state level, uh, because of the some of the animosity that exists between you know uh, some of those candidates with the different parties, so yeah. I think we're going to have a we're going to see a we're going to have a, a lot on our plates yeah. this year. Yeah. yeah, well, we're going to be watching closely. Senator Sullivan, Representative David Smyer, thank you both for being here. Certainly appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks again for having us. Lawmakers is brought to you in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and through the financial support of viewers like you. Thank you.